Egypt. It's a country where worlds collide, and where modern life merges with traditions that date back to the time of the pharaohs. A land steeped in history, it has more monuments than any other ancient civilization. My family and I visited Egypt throughout my childhood, and I've grown up immersed in its history and culture. The last few years have seen a major upheaval, and through the media, we were kept up to date with every heartbreaking moment. The presence of women during events was unprecedented in what is traditionally a segregated society, and it seems to indicate there's major change occurring. I'm here to talk about things I probably shouldn't on an undercover journey that will take me to Cairo, Luxor, and London. visit, and a great deal has happened between then and now. Egypt's revolution was a demand for change that crossed all divides of class, religion and gender. Millions of people spilled onto the streets to topple a 30-year regime and then later the first democratically elected president. The journey, while political, has also been a personal one, with cries for bread, freedom, dignity and social justice mixed with cries for more sexual rights. I've come to London to ask Shireen Alfeki, sexual rights advocate and author of the controversial book Sex and the Citadel, whether she believes Egypt is ready for what many are calling a sexual revolution. In Egypt and across the Arab region, we have what are called the three red lines. These are subjects that you're not supposed to tackle in word or deed. So the first of these red lines is politics. And of course, that line has been well and truly crossed since 2011. The second red line is religion. One is seeing people ask questions of religion. Who speaks for Islam, for example? What should be the role of Islam in public life? That third red line, that third red line is sex. Now, the change that millions of us as, as liberal Egyptians had hoped for hasn't quite come to pass. So if we're not seeing a revolution in political life, we're certainly not going to see it in personal life, and we're definitely not going to see it in sexual life. Because sexuality, at the end of the day, is so much more complex than politics. It brings in religion, it brings in economics, it brings in tradition. It's like a very complex tapestry. And if you want to weave a new pattern, that is going to take time. So we're not talking about revolution here, we're talking about evolution. Cairo has seen dark days since the uprisings began in 2011. The journalist I'm about to meet represents one of millions of women who broke with tradition to take part in the revolution. Ikram covered events on the ground for a major newspaper, but as protests escalated, she was faced with increasing danger. Covering the revolution was challenging in many ways, not only because I'm a woman, but because it was dangerous sometimes. I remember one night, it was November 2011, and I was out with a female photographer from the newspaper I work for. We were running, like, we are running, running, like many people, like hundreds of people on the street in Tahrir Square running, and you have the police running after us with guns and you just hear the sound, you just have to run for your life. And I remember at that time, my friend told me that she has seen the red laser just above my head. I know it was dangerous, but I think, I don't know, what we were fighting for was worth it. Women have been really, really a very big part of the Egyptian revolution. If you're on the street, you'd see many women taking part, and that's very new to the Egyptian culture. Like that women are on the street fighting, protesting and saying, hey, stop this, we, don't, we end the corruption, end Mubarak's rule, whatever. This was awkward. Just, it's not culture really accepted, but women were on the street from the first day. 
and I have like met several friends who used to say, I started going to the revolution and taking part because my wife started first, because my wife pushed me, because my wife was in Tahrir Square and I couldn't sit here at home watching television on the sofa and my wife is there and I'm not there. So her being there pushed some men as well to be part because they felt, oh, if a woman can do this, why can't I? Over 40% of the protesters were women. But violent sexual attacks that followed the fall of the regime led many to question their safety. As the political movement intensified, so too did the attacks, with as many as 100 violent sexual assaults recorded in a single evening. During the first 18 days of the revolution, there was really no sexual harassment happening. It was very, very clean, safe zone where the energy was all targeted towards the end goal that everyone was looking for. When, when you have this energy and this cause, it's not about sexual harassment, it's about helping. The mob attacks or the sexual mob attacks are not regarding that. This is not the same mentality of a guy who is going on the street because he's fighting for a cause. That's a different kind of mentality, which joined the street later, not from day one. By nature, I believe I'm a very courageous person, but when the mob attacks, the sexual mob attacks started in Tahrir Square, I felt really unsafe. And I think starting that, I decided not to go and cover in Tahrir Square anymore. HarassMap is a volunteer organization whose mission is to change the way sexual harassment is viewed across Egypt. Part of their role was to support women who were violently attacked during the uprisings. Nora and Ahmed work as part of the team and both joined HarassMap after witnessing sexual assaults on the streets of downtown Cairo. I started you know, focusing on working with se on sexual harassment professionally when I, uh, I saw a mob assault in front, uh, like in front of the prison in Maadi. A group of, of thugs, like they are harassing an 18 years old girl because she was protesting against the government. And there was like a policeman in front of the, them and they didn't do anything. I remember I called my friends, my, my female friends, and I was like checking on them, like even if they are not around, but like I felt like insecurity about my friends and my sisters and my family. And from here, yeah, I, I couldn't handle it anymore. But what is it that motivates people to take part in such attacks? So there are a couple of things that kind of influence this like mob creation. So one is just the idea that you can comment on or touch a woman in the streets with impunity. So you can do it when you go to work uh, on like a Sunday morning uh, and you can do it in Tahrir Square during a celebration or a protest and nothing will happen. It's just kind of like it's allowed, it's normal, it's, it's what guys do. And this is of course again like an extreme form of what we see on the streets on like everyday situations. So I might get harassed by a guy verbally and s some other guys might see it happening and they think like oh yeah, I'll do it too, and then they also do it and other people are around and no one will stop them, like no one will interfere. So the same thing in, in Tahrir Square, for example. People see this happening and they choose to join in rather than seeing, no, this is not okay, I'm going to try to stop it. You can hear like horrible stories about the mob assaults. We are talking about sometimes it's the mob assaults between 200 harassers and like sometimes it's like 1,000 person around one girl or one lady and like you can't you can't see if they are uh, like trying to help her or trying to harassing her so it's I mean it's it's a mess um, and they were very violent um, and people were using like sticks and sharp objects while mob attacks are extreme a UN report estimates that over 99.3 percent of women in Egypt get harassed on a daily basis the vast majority of sexual assaults go unreported, including my own experience back in the 1990s when I was attacked by a group of teenagers in a local market. My father intervened, but the locals persuaded us not to report it. The boys were just being boys. Erasmus want to change this with their online reporting system which allows people who witness or experience sexual harassment to record it on their website. They're also trying to raise awareness with street campaigns designed to encourage people to intervene and speak out when they see or experience sexual harassment. 
but it's a daily problem. I get harassed every day. <laughs> every time I go outside the door, I know that this is a possibility that I will experience some kind of sexual harassment. It happens everywhere, all kinds of areas and neighborhoods. It happens all the time, morning, day, evening, night. Most of the time it's verbal harassment or even just like body language or looking up and down. Uh, but also touching. When you're in public transport or anywhere where it's a bit crowded, it happens very easily. Uh, even when I'm on my bike, it happens. Like People try to touch me while they're driving by. You have to prepare yourself mentally. It's an everyday thing that happens. You eat food every day and you get harassed every day. the city of Giza. It's home to the pyramids and over 7 million people. I'm here to gain a better understanding of the everyday dynamics around marriage, family and the patriarch. There are many expectations on what a woman should be and what a good woman should do. And there are many rules put upon you. Women are expected to take care of the house and in many times work as well. If you're talking about more of the middle class women, they get educated but still the way they get married and the dynamics between her and her husband it's more of him superior to her you're always wired not only for freedom but you're always wired since you were born on marriage like fixated a family is absolutely key it is the bedrock of one's personal life and it's also bedrock of society because at the end of the day Marriage is about two families coming together, which is important for the state because it, in cementing the role of the father and the family, you actually, in reflection, cement the role of the head of, of, the, head of the state, the, the dictator, the authoritarian figure. head of the family and has lived in the home he built for over 20 years. Started the play uh, just to only one uh, floor and uh, I do working uh, very hard to build uh, another three floor. 18 people, uh, me and my family, are living in my home here. Uh, I'm living in Giza all my life. When I walk in the neighborhood here, everybody likes to invite me for a, for a meal, for a cup of tea or something. But I have been living in this place in almost uh, 22 years. Suede is Adil's wife, and it's her responsibility to feed the family. I'm around 4 or 5 o'clock. They start to the, make the meal for us. Most of the kitchen working in area here is, is, is a woman. And we sit all together uh, to have the meal all together every day like this. And the flower bouncing. Everything what's happening. Must know it. Every every small piece at my home, I must know it. The man always have the key. My name is Dalia. I am 21 years old. I have married uh, Muhammad. Is uh, the son of Aidil. My uh, mother-in-law is uh, is my aunt. We are uh, really is one family. Before, uh, they forced the, the girl to marry. But now, after the computer and so and the net and so so, she can choose her boyfriend, not like before. Uh, I didn't have a chance to do something like this because uh, my father, my mother, she was a choice this for me. She, she was 14 years and I was 16 and almost now uh, 35 years of uh, being married. باختياري انا وهو يعني اختيارنا احنا في الاول وبعد كده جت موافقه الاهل والخطوبه كانت من حوالي 3 سنين قبل الزواج ف يعني من اول الخطوبه ابتدى ان يكون في تداخل اكتر بين الاسرتين يعني انا مثلا لازم اهتم بيه لازم اصون العيله اللي انا دخلت فيها 
ده أهم حاجة وبالمقابل هلاقي هلاقي ده منه أكيد أبطل ناو إتس جود Mohammed's wedding lasted for three days, attracting over 1,500 people from across the region. Wale is Dahlia's sister-in-law. Uh, I'm Wale. Uh, I'm married from uh, six years. Uh, I got married uh, in 18 years old. My day is a very normal, very, very, very normal, like every woman uh, in my area here. I come to uh, work's house here with my auntie. After that, uh, I uh, rearrange my department uh, and return to my auntie to uh, uh, prepare um, our food. Everything from 25 to 30 years, everything has changed. The, we give her a choice and uh, we give her a freedom. She can do what uh, maybe she wants to do in, in university or something. Maybe university is not in Cairo, maybe in, in Alex, she can do it. Is, uh, everything is a freedom here, uh, not like before. Yet despite these modern times, the reality for Dahlia and Wale has been quite different. Before my marriage, uh, my big dream and my important dream uh, to go on in my education and, uh, and to work in, uh, in media uh, and be uh, a journalist. My education was in uh, another town uh, and uh, my family and my fiancé, uh, actually my husband now, uh, never approved to live, uh, to live another town alone. Uh, my father uh, don't want me uh, work uh, and Muhammad. حلمي في الدراسة من ناحية الدراسة إن كان نفسي أدخل كلية فنون جميلة. ده كان حلمي الوحيد وكان نفسي أحققه. بس مجرد مخلص سنوية عامة والدي رفض الكلية. أنا نفسي دلوقتي مش شايفة ملامح لإن أنا أشتغل. ممكن أحتاج الكلام ده بعدين. If my daughter, uh, uh, when she grew up, wanted to uh, go another town uh, to study a media or another uh, or anything another, uh, I will uh, help her uh, to uh, to to make her uh, her dream uh, true. Uh, in this case, uh, I feel uh, my dream uh, it's uh, it's be come to come true through my uh, my daughter. One of the reasons for their family's reaction is their safety. Everybody um, is very afraid for, uh, to walk uh, alone in the street. The situation in the street is that the children are not allowed to go to any age, even if they are not allowed to go to any age or to wear any age. There is a place where the child will tell you that the child is the one who is wearing it. مشيت البنت هي لبس استفزاني تم في منتقبات كتير ماشية وبرضو بيتم التحرش بيهم وفي ناس كتير لبس لبس ضيق ولبس يعني اللي هم مفروض إنه هو ده اللي هم بيقولوا عليه إن ده اللي بيستفز الشباب وما حدش بيقرب لها. For the moment, they remain positive about the future. What I look for my family is growing very, growing up very clean. As the, as the, uh, his father and his grandfather was growing before. We, uh, we want uh, to live in a uh, happy life uh, with uh, uh, my father-in-law um, and uh, my mother-in-law uh, and uh, two children. After I, uh, I have my children, uh, they can uh, make me uh, forget everything, even my dreams. <laughs> Just across the other side of town lies a very different way of life. I've come to meet Amal, but due to the nature of her story, I can't reveal her true identity. I was always rebellious, as, you know, with things like you can't do this, you can't do that. I, I think my parents had a hard time with me, really hard time, because I was just not conforming with whatever rules they were putting uh, for me. Uh, I was actually born in my grandmother's uh, place in Giza. My dad was 
he came from uh, Saeed, Upper Egypt, started from, from nothing. He had ex absolutely nothing. Uh, my mom lived in Giza. She was one of ten. I never really knew the difference between a boy and a girl. But when my brother was born, I, then I actually saw the difference. He is the boy, you are the girl. You're supposed to be doing certain things and he was supposed to be the, the powerful things as far as I saw it. I wasn't allowed to to be back home after eight o'clock. This is something that I really hated right from the start. Amal's father worked overseas, but after she refused to abide by the rules, he moved her along with the rest of the family to the UK. I hated it because I was taken from my friends, people that I love. But as time went on, you know, I started to see the good side of it. Uh, and that was like, oh God, I can't believe it. I couldn't believe how free they were. Seeing a, a man and a woman kiss in the street, you know, to me was, <gasps> you know, how can they do that? And this is where most of my, uh, how can I say it, most of my rebellion years and finding myself and knowing what I want. I remember having a conversation with my dad where I was saying, what if I don't want to get married? What would happen? And he, he, he said, what do you mean you don't want to get married? You know, you have to get married. You know, women who don't get married are looked upon very badly in society and you cannot be not married. I said, but what if I don't care? You have to know this, that you are under my dominance and you will be under it no matter what you cannot get out of that until you get married. And if I die, it will be your brothers who will be taking care of you. And when I heard this, I was at the age of 23, and it was then that I decided I'm going to leave home, no matter what happens. I will actually leave home. His daughter being going away from his house without getting married, it is breaking his honor. If, my, if it takes my dad killing me, because that was the option. If you leave home, you die. But I thought I will die anyway. Egypt is home to over 90 million people and shows no signs of slowing down. Every six months, one million new Egyptians are born. And every year, over a million of them get married. I think if a woman just didn't get married by the age of like starting 25, 30, you start, question marks start raising up, like, so why aren't you married? Aren't you, aren't you interested in marriage? So what's wrong with you? The great fear here is that she will go off the rails, that she will want to have sex before marriage, she might be tempted to do that, or she might make excessive sexual demands of her husband during marriage, both of which are marriage killers. And so in order to preserve this, this, this virginity. Families will go to all sorts of lengths to preserve virginity, for example, female genital mutilation, uh, in order to keep girls on the straight and narrow so they're not tempted to have sex before marriage is the belief that underpins the practice in many cases. This is about the family's honor. This is not about individual honor, this is the family's honor. That the family has succeeded in bringing up their girl, that she is a virgin, and they have managed to deliver the genuine article to the groom on the wedding night. Knowing full well of the consequences, Amal decided to leave home. I made a decision to, to leave home. My dad didn't kill me, right? So I survived that. I, I worked in England for, for, for some time, and that was my way to be independent, because I worked really hard. So I had the money, I had the financial backup of me. I started to live my life and pursue my, my dream. I've always loved my country. You know, Egypt, you know, it, it's always a treasure to me. I love being here, I love the people, I, I love everything about it. I love the warmth, I love the sun, and England wasn't giving me that. So I had decided that I was gonna go back to Egypt and live my life in Egypt with all the restrictions, but I'm gonna manage it one way or another. And that's actually the, the beginning of the story of how I got married. Uh, I met an unconventional man, open-minded, just it was all coincidence. You know, like one night we were having fun and partying and talking as usual, 
and then um, it was brought up like I was saying I want to I want to have kids but I don't want to get married but I, I really want to have kids I want to feel I want to be a mother and uh, he said me too you know I want to have kids but I don't want the commitment of a family and the women being financially dependent and I don't want the conventional uh, life in any ways I thought wow this is this is just the right guy for me uh, and that way was the way for me to be accepted again by my parents and that's how my father accepted me back because I said look I'm gonna get married I'm gonna do what you like and then I went to Egypt and he came to Egypt as well but we've never lived like a married couple I actually have two boys. We agreed I think in 96 that let's, let's start working on having a baby. And this is when my first son came. But that's not where this story ends. Under the cover of tradition, Amal was able to explore a life unthinkable. I always felt that there was something not right about dating men. I didn't want to be the odd one, so that's why I did it. Uh, but I started feeling different feelings at the age of, I think, 13, 14, you know, feeling different feelings towards certain women friends that I had. And that's when I started thinking, oh, I'm weird. Obviously, homosexuality is regarded as a taboo, religiously and culturally. Assuming that there is no abundance of lesbians is a, is a wrong assumption because there are plenty of lesbians in Egypt. I, I know plenty. You do not admit, and some of them do not admit to themselves what they are. It is regarded worse for men than it is for women, for, funny enough. Uh, for a man to be gay, that's really bad. You see, being gay takes the manhood from you. So if, you're, if, if you are gay, then you're not a man. How can you be accepted, right? But also in Quran, what was mentioned about homosexuality was about men, not women. So you get to see that there are men caught of homosexual acts, but you never hear of women being caught of homosexual acts. You see, women are regarded as a lesser being anyway. <laughs> so even in the relationships with other women, they are regarded as of less importance. After being away from Egypt, I was, at this time, a very different person than I was 10 years before. I was capable of making my own decisions and capable of making things happen. I was still in love with the woman I was uh, at, at the age of 16. We started a relationship straight away. You know, as soon as I came, five days afterwards. We managed it in a way that she was able to live with me. But there had to be a plan that we don't live together in front of people. I managed to get us uh, like one floor in a building where it has two flats opposite each other. That was the, the cover up and that's how we did it. Uh, and we were together until uh, 2010. Until I met my current partner, I had no intention of being into any relationships. You know, I thought, let me have a break here and I need a couple of years of a good break. I've never had a, a relationship with the other side of the world, with a European or an American. She's a lovely woman and uh, I, I just uh, couldn't resist her. It was the internet that brought Amal and Jay together. When the revolution happened, I joined Twitter and about a year later, is when I met Amal on Twitter. She told me, shared her story with me of what she went through to live the life that she wanted. Very impressive to me. Um, I've not known too many people in my life that were like that and who could overcome such obstacles. And to be able to negotiate an existence that you love in a culture where your existence is not recognized. To me, that's fascinating. There's a difference, I think, when your family isn't even accepting at all of being a lesbian or being gay, that the culture says, no, this is sinful and wrong. Things have changed. Back in the 1970s, Egypt was much open. I think there was a wave that came in, and I think it was in the early 1980s, where 
a lot of men were having jobs in Saudi. Okay, and when they go to Saudi, they get to learn Islam as it should be. They come back to Egypt and obviously they, they, they do it the right way. And that was the start of when I saw all my aunts getting veiled in no time. My family is very religious. Um, most of my aunts were in, were in a cup. The only person who's not wearing hijab in my family, mother and father's side, is me. At least 10% of the population is Christian. And while Christianity and Islam differ in their ideology, both share similarities when it comes to taboo subjects and the importance of marriage. Religion is the way of life. Telling my boys has always made me feel like mm, this is a subject I don't want to get into. Maybe when they get older. I kept saying maybe when they get older, older. And now my son is much older. So it is not an easy feeling because when you feel that he can be rejected by your own son, that there is a, there is a possibility that you're rejected by your own son or that your son could be ashamed of you. It's going to be tough, so the, 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 the decision is very hard. Being with my partner now, who is totally uh, accepting herself and she's totally out, actually, which is something I'm, I'm not yet. When I want to talk to my boys about who I am, she gives me that strength that I really need. But still, it's a very hard feeling. And when I think about it, I think of the risks. But when I see no, it is possible, I can do it. It is exactly what I need at this stage of my life. And I have taken so many risks in my life. My life has been a big risk. Kilometers south of Cairo lies the tourist town of Luxor. Its beautiful temples line the banks of the Nile, and the pace of life feels like it hasn't changed in centuries. What men want, it is a universal question. Uh, what I have found in Egypt and across the Arab world is that uh, we actually know very little about men and their feelings around personal life, around marriage, around ch fatherhood, for example. The reality for men is that they are under pressure as well. Different pressure, less pressure in many cases than women, but theirs is not a problem-free life. The problem about marriage is that marriage has become very expensive. The fast rule that men should pay has actually, in a sense, uh, hardened over recent decades with the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and a real rigidity around what is the appropriate behavior for men and the appropriate behavior for women. One needs to keep in mind that in a patriarchy, unless you're at the very top of that pyramid, life can be tough. And until we really start talking to men about how they feel about their changing role in society, how they feel about women's role in society, we will never be able to achieve equality between the, between the sexes. Tourism is a major source of income for Luxor. But since the uprisings began, all but a handful of tourists have stayed away. I've known Mohammed since he was a small boy, working the boats with his father. But these are very different times. Since the three years now, it's not many tourists because about the problems in Cairo and like this. And tourists, it's our life, you know. All in my village, all people in my village, they work for tourists. They're very quiet now. When I have a tourist, that will be my best time because uh, I make them round. 
history of Peru and like this. I have fun and I enjoy my time. The high cost associated with marriage means this loss of income is a challenge for those like Mohammed that wish to marry. Everyone need married but cost too much. At least 100,000 Egyptian. At least. Yani if you want to be medium. Sometimes families, they are choose to the person and then your family, uh, they ask about her, about her family, that good or not, because they must have to be a good family. After that, you will have engaged, if that's okay. You invite uh, all people they, you know in a village. Next day, you go to get your wife and then enjoy it. Uh, you can see her is good or not because you don't know anything about what she have or what is special, she's okay or not or like this. And we're saying here like uh, watermelon. After uh, you open the watermelon, you will see if it's good test and like this, you will keep her. And if not, after two, three months, you force her and it is not good. But it is for the people they have money. Where I live, it's uh, no women work. They think if the women work, he will not be the boss. She will be the boss. She not caring about man. All they are relies on him. Anything they family spend, man they have to pay for everything. And uh, the women always she spend your money. Women here. It's intelligent. Peru people uh, love. It is a very important for them. They always have a God for love, and then love it is from soul to soul or from heart to heart. When I have children, I want to give good life to them. I want to look after them very well school, everything. But I want to have a relationship because time is run. When it comes to the discussion of sex and sexuality, sometimes it takes an outsider to break down the walls. My name's Sandra. I live in Scotland. I first came to Egypt in 2008. Since then, I have been 38 times. I don't know if it's the people, the sunshine, or the view. I just love it all. To begin with, I just knew the men. Once they got to know me, um, I was invited more to their homes. I have met wives, I have met children, I have met the mothers, I've met the sisters. I think because I've built up a relationship with many of the Egyptian men here, a lot of them see me as like a motherly figure, but fun. They ask many things. They're very, very shy about asking. Not so much now because they know that they can ask me anything, but some of the things they tell me, I feel so frustrated for them. I find that they're lacking very much education, as in like sex education. The even biology about your body. They don't know about their own bodies, never mind a woman's body. I've been lucky enough to find a local businessman willing to answer some of the more complex questions surrounding women in Egypt. My name is Sayed. I'm from Luxor. I'm a fisherman before and I work in the Nile and my nickname and I love it, uh, Mr. Fish. I mean when I ask, ask the question why you love the boy more than the girl, not really. Both same. Girl make family work very hard. Very, very hard. About the boy, don't care. This boy. Even him go be not good, that man. Him can be not, that's okay. For girl, no. It's so difficult. Girl must be good. Must be good. Girl not allowed even to go out to have some boy to walk in with her. About maybe she do mistake. A relationship with someone 
and in the family you don't know it. You know, maybe some boy or man give her nice talk, and she relax too much, and her body go like that, and easy now him can touch or have extra synchrony, and after they say bye bye. I don't want to marry you. What's the family do to her? Big trouble. Will kill her. You know about she make bad way for all the family. As for sex, the Egyptian men don't know what to do. Many of the European women are actually teaching the young men. Some of them speak about it, about the experience of their wedding night. They didn't have a clue. They sat with their wife for an hour and a half after everyone had finished the party and they were so shy and they physically did not know what to do. The Egyptian women, many have told me, it's their duty. If their husband wants sex, it's their duty. I am being married seven years. My wife, she no experience, nothing. She don't understand anything. I teach her, really. I'm not saying she's not good or she not understand, no, no, no. I give her times and I teach her. I understand all that. Thank to God's experience too. But I thought that wasn't allowed. I'm a person, okay? And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no everyone do everything perfect, 100%. If some girl, she do something wrong, even to herself. If someone gentle, and you know how much she loved him, and I understand that before, and you know she good person very well, you must don't say anything, and you keep inside. I believe from what I hear is the woman has been in the home to make the babies, to cook the dinner, and the man has been the earner, like it was in Britain many years ago. People that I know here from the likes of 50 year old right down to the 21 year olds they know it's not good to have it this way but they don't know how it's going to change because it's a repeat of tradition 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 they are looking for love and i believe that their wives are looking for love as well but they don't know how to give each other love they only know their position she's in the home having the children and he's out earning the money dynamic and exciting sexual lives, but on the other hand, the expectations are pumped up by the huge volumes of porn that is going down across the Arab world. The video clips and all this culture has intensified like the sexual um, energy or the sexual desire in Egyptian men, yet you watch, you open on the TV and you watch with your family a woman who is dancing, wearing provocative clothes that you won't accept your daughter to wear, neither your wife to wear, and you're really liking it. Most young people in Egypt find it very difficult to get a job. So men are having to wait to get married until their late 20s. The question is, what are you going to do in all that time? Because again, if you don't get married, it's hard to move out of your family's place. You're not supposed to be having sex and you're not supposed to be having children. Now the Prophet Muhammad suggested that we as Muslims, if we, if we had to wait to get married, we, that we should fast. But the Prophet Muhammad did not mean that we were supposed to fast until our 30s. Religious conservatives, no matter what the faith, use sex as a tool to control people because it's very powerful. If you control someone's sexual life, you control them at the heart of their lives. Tourism often serves as a way for locals to explore romance with other cultures. Talat has worked in the industry his whole life and is willing to share his story of love and loss. My name is Talat and I'm from Luxor. I started working in 1991. We met in a hotel where I was uh, always uh, working. In. The only way we can keep touch together, it's a letter. 
and so we can send the letter to each other, but yani, this can take a month or maybe more than a month. In the beginning, they considered as a friend, a family friend. And then they start to notice that we are in relation or in love together. This means after we met around three, four years. And then we start to meet each other and saw each other. And the night was free to go everywhere. We go out to coffee shops, shisha together, and laugh. Just we'd only do laughing, laughing together. But because I was the bad Muslim in my family, <laughs> they don't care about this one. They never ask me a question. And this time I was planned to marry her, and I gave her this ring for her. We stay in relation until 2000, and then she disappeared. And I was keeping sending the letter to her, but I have no reply. I have no clue why and how she disappeared, just disappears. I only think she disappeared because she didn't want me anymore. You know, I, I, I don't know if, my, if me or just is normal. And somehow, I cannot be give up quickly. But after a while, you should do. Five years, خلاص. I forced to marry from my family. You cannot stay like that. You should marry. Then I, I know some, I know a few girls, but as we believe in family, I ask my mom where I can go to get married. He said, yes, choose. There's one, two, three houses. You can choose one of them. Then I start to know her, I start to, eat, to talk to each other, start to be nice together. And then we left together for only six months. I think two months later, we get married. That done. Of course, I love my wife. And I have four kids. To be honest, it's a happy life. Or, a, or a, I'm happy. I'm happy with my family. But after 14 years, contact is made. She found me in a website, and she sent me an email. The world is very small to find you here. The Egypt I fell in love with 20 years ago is still very much here. It's sad so few tourists are visiting, and I only hope things begin to pick up. It's been great to reconnect with the place after all this time. And, thanks to the internet, Talat is reunited with, well, me. keep in mind is that women in the Arab region, women in Egypt are not helpless and they are not hopeless. They are getting on with life. It's just very often they do it in a different way. That women are, are empowered, that women have more control over their lives does not mean that men lose out from this. But it is no easy task in Egypt or anywhere in the world. Amal's story is one of courage and perseverance. She defied all the odds to create her life in the country that she loves. Telling my son is like a journey. Specifically in the past two years, I've been preparing him for this because I knew eventually I'll be able to, to say it. And that's what happened, you know, one day we were just chatting and uh, he, it was very surprising to me because he was asking questions, not about why or who I was with, he was just asking general question around the subject. It was very nice. It was, it, was, it was actually much better than I expected. I expected him to be maybe a bit of anger, a bit of you know, disbelief, nothing of that sort. It was like I was telling him a bedtime story. I feel I've done a good job. This is how I wanted my son to be. I haven't told, obviously, my younger son yet. Not now, I think he's, you know, he's a bit young to grasp certain things, but definitely I will, very soon. As for Talat and I, 
It's a very different world today to the one we met in, that had no cell phones or even internet. And it's not an easy task to come back and face a person after all this time. My attack in the market scared me and made me question whether I could live in a society where harassment is so readily accepted. It's one thing for it to happen to me, but the thought of bringing a family into it is another case altogether. The truth is, I didn't know how to say that our cultural differences felt insurmountable. I have this one, but I don't have, I can remember this one as well. I thought you have a hundred or a thousand pictures because every time I see you, you hold your big camera, so it's a big camera and a small one. And you only get three pictures for us. Must this one in 1998? Yeah, I would have been university. After the accident in Luxor, mm -hmm. one year later, when I was in Orgada, you came. Yes. And this one in Orgada. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Despite being out of contact, we still have 10 years of letters together. Say, dear Natasha, Nana. Nana is like a nickname at this time, but I don't know if it's working that. I was glad to receive your kind letter and learn that you are well. Believe me, there is no good place better than your country. Who's right this word? Me? <laughs> it seems my disappearance was destined from our very first letter. The best thing which had happened to me in your absence is that all the people at the hotel congratulate me. You know why? Because they think that you and I will marry. I love that and I believe them and I hope it comes true in the future. So please don't go forever. <laughs> I didn't go forever. I came back up to you 14 did. years. You did. <laughs> Something I wrote here and I expected this happened. Stepping outside the boundaries of societies and the rules and the cultures and the religion is very difficult. It's not easy at all. We need to learn how to accept our differences. We need to listen to each other, which we don't. The last years in Egypt have been really difficult. I wanted to see a better Egypt. I wanted to see Egypt that is accepting differences in every way. And I thought the revolution would shuffle. It did, in a way, shuffle some things. But where it's ending now, people can't stand each other for political differences, let alone other differences. It's about teaching our children. Do not stop. You know, keep going. Keep finding ways for yourself. Uh, keep fighting for who you are. Don't give up. It's been a remarkable journey, and I've been amazed at how willing people have been to share their stories. For all of Egypt's complexities, I am certain it will always stay close to me.